Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. We have finished doing almost all the problem from this book. If there is any problem that gives you trouble and if you are interested in watching the solutions to the problem, you will find the solutions from day number 251 through 400. From 251 through 400, this book happens to contain the exact same problems in most cases and in most cases appearing on exact same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. We are finished doing all the problems from this book. In the event that you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find your original solutions from day number 1 through 250. From day number 1 through 250. Right now, we are in the process of solving some quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions are a very important part of the exam. They have not gone away. And because of the fact that the other two books do not provide us enough practice problem for quantitative comparison questions, starting from day number 401, we began solving some quantitative comparison questions out of this book here, the 10th edition of the general GRE. Please turn to it. We are on page number 265. Please turn to it. Page number 265, problem number 11. The problem is already on the blackboard. Problem number 11, when it appeared in the exam, 63% of the people got it right. Here's what it says. It says that on a turntable, on a turntable, a record of six inches, a record of radius six inches, is rotating at the rate of 45 revolution per minute. So we have a record rotating at the rate of 45 revolution per minute, we are told that the radius of the record is 6 inches. All we are being asked to compare is the amount of distance that a point will travel, the distance traveled by a point, distance traveled by a point on the circumference. So here's our, here's our record. And the distance traveled by this point in, distance traveled by a point on a record, it should say a time period, otherwise it has no meaning in a minute in a minute. How, how much of a distance the point will travel, this point will travel in one minute versus distance traveled by a point located five inches from the center in one minute. So the amount of time of course is the same and this point, this is the center here and it is located at five inches from the center. This is five inches and this point right here is located at six inches. That's all. I'll give you two seconds to figure out the answer and then we'll do it together. Pause the video do it yourself. There we go. It's a pretty straightforward question. The distance that will be traveled in one revolution by this point here, let's call that point A, is the circumference of the circle. Right here is the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi r. And the fact that it is, it is rotating at the rate of 45 revolution per second, therefore in a minute it will, it will go around 45 times. Each time it goes around a revolution, it travels 2 times pi times r inches. 2 pi r is the circumference. 2 pi r is the circumference. All we have to do is substitute the value of the radius here, which is 6 inches. So it's 2 times pi times r, which is 6, times 45. Now here, the only difference is that this point has a, has a distance from the center of only 5 inches. We can't call it radius, but that's what it is, it's 5 inches, and each time this point travels, a rev uh, tra makes a revolution, it goes through a smaller circle. It goes through a smaller circle, it goes through a circle of 5 inches. So it's 2 times pi times r, which in this case is 5, times 45. As you can see, they are the exact same quantity, the only difference is that, only difference is that this one has, has, a, has, a, has a larger radius, and therefore it will travel more distance, that's what it is. Because otherwise, if you, want to, if you want to look at it in a more mechanical way, we can look at the two quantities, we can divide, we can divide both columns by 2 and the 2 goes away. We can divide both columns by pi, pi goes away. These are common factors. We can divide 45, we can divide both columns by 45, 45 is a common factor. It's 5 versus 6, of course, the answer is A. The point that is farther away from the center will travel more distance, obviously, because it has a bigger radius. Number, number 12. Number 12, just give me one second. Number 
Number 12, when it appeared in the exam, actually is even, actually is even easier than the one we just finished, when it appeared in the exam, the percentile was 70%. So it's got, it's got to be quite straightforward. Here's what we've been asked to compare. Greatest, greatest even factor, even, greatest even factor of 180, that is, that is less, that is less than less than 90. That's our column A. In column B we have the greatest odd factor of 180. So we're being asked to compare the greatest odd factor of 180 versus the greatest even factor of 180 but the only, the only requirement is that when we're doing the even factor, even factor that we're looking for it has to be less than 90. The greatest even factor of 180 less than 90, greatest even factor of 180 that is less than 90 versus the greatest odd factor of 180. I'll give you two seconds to do it yourself, pause the video, do it yourself. You must always, every, at the end, of, as soon as I finish setting up the problem, as I always remind you, you must pause the video immediately, solve the problem yourself, and then compare your work against the work that we do together. Do you understand? You will get more out that way. But the greatest even factor, the greatest even factor of 180 is 90. That's the greatest even factor. But the requirement that it has to be less than 90, that means it cannot be 90, obviously it has to be less than 90. So the greatest even factor that happens to be less than 90 is 60. That's the greatest even factor we're going to find. The greatest odd factor of 180 is 45. That's all. That's all there is. And of course, for 60 is more than 45. The answer is A. That's how simple it is. There's nothing to it. Do you understand? Let's do the next problem. Before we do the next problem, before we do the next problem, let's do a, a problem very similar, very similar to the one that we just finished, a bonus problem, a problem that is not in the book, a very similar, uh, a problem that does appear frequently on the exam, something like this. So here we're being asked to compare number of, number of prime factors of 180. So they want you to count, they want us to count how many prime factor 180 has. That's what they're looking for. How many does it have? Number of prime factors of 180 versus versus the greatest, greatest prime factor of 180. Pause the video. I insist that you pause the video, do it yourself, and then once you have done it, unpause it and compare your work against the work we'll do together. I'll give you five seconds to do just that, pause and unpause. All right. The number of prime factors of 180. When we want to find a prime factor of 180, or for that matter, any number that ends in a zero, for example, instead of 180, instead of, given, instead of 180, if we had 180,000, if we had 180,000, and if you insist on leaving the 180,000 the way it is, well, that's actually 18,000, isn't it? I'm not a math person. Instead of, instead of, instead of, instead of uh, if you insist on leaving the 18,000 as 18,000, if you try to figure out the factors of 18,000, that will take you forever and ever. Do you understand? The, the trick here, when something ends in a zero, listen carefully, when something ends in a zero, no matter how many zeros it has, the trick is to break it up immediately. Break it up immediately. This thing, this thing is the same as 18 times 1,000. And what are the factors of 10? 1,000, 10 raised to 3. What are the factors of 10? Factors of 10 are very easy. 10 is only two factors. 5 times 2. 5 times 2. And because it is raised to 3, it's 5 raised to 3 and 2 raised to 3. If we had 18,000. And then we worry about 18 by itself. Do you understand? Then we worry about 18 by itself. Here we don't have 18,000. We just have 180. So we just have to worry about 18 times 10. We don't have the third power. And the factors of 10... The factors of 10 are 5 and 2. We are done. Now let's worry about the factors of 18. 
factors of 10 are 5 and 2 and they both happen to be prime factors but we'll, we'll get to that in a second let's, let's, let's start looking for factors of 18 let's divide by 2 we get a 9 divide by 3 we get a 3 and that's it 3 is the prime factor we are done so what are the factors of uh, what are the prime factors of 180 prime factors of 180 are prime prime factors of 180 are 2 3 we can count 3 one again we only counted 3 we already counted 2 we can't count the 2 again we can count the 3 again and 5 that's it it looks like it looks like 180 has only 2 or only 3 prime factors 2 3 and 5 2 and 5 come from the 10 and then 18 is broken up into 2s and 3, but 2 is already counted there. So that's it. The prime factors of 18 are 2, 3, and 5. First column says the number of prime factors of 180. The answer is 3. The answer is 3. 180 has 3 prime factors. The next column is asking us for the greatest prime factor of 180. The greatest among these prime factors is 5. So we have 3 versus 5. The answer is the first column was 3. Answer the second column is 5, and therefore the answer is B. Therefore, the answer is B. Let's do the next one. That was a bonus question. If you are interested in learning how to figure out prime factors of numbers very quickly, just type in prime factors along with my name, and a whole bunch of videos will pop up, and watch all of those videos, and you will learn, uh, you will see quite a few problems dealing with prime factors. Number 13. Question number 13. Question number 13, when it appeared in the exam, only 39% of the people had luck with it, about three-fifths of the people who took the exam missed it. It's a geometry question, we are given two circles, one circle here, another circle here, and here we have a length PR, and here we have a length of you are. So far, so good. So far, so good. And the question is, they want us to, and they tell us that this, this distance PR, the length of segment PR, the length of segment PR, we are told, is same as the length of segment RQ. This distance is same as this distance. One more time, we are told that the length of segment PR is same as the length of segment QR. These two segments have equal length. So far so good. Column A. In column A they want us to compare the circumference of circle C1. They're calling this circle C1 and this circle C2 versus the circumference of circle C2. Column B. So which of these circles will have larger circumference or will they have the equal number, equal length, or will they have the circumf uh, circumference of equal length? That's what we have to figure out here. I give you two seconds to pause and unpause the video. Do it yourself. Now here's what's going on. What is missing here is that we do not know what is missing here. The key here, the reason why the percentile is so low is because people, people take liberties. You mustn't take liberties in the exam. The pictures in this exam are not drawn to scale. You cannot assume, you cannot take liberties. What is missing here is that we do not know where this point P and Q are located. If, if P and Q, if P and Q happen, happen to be the centers of C1 and C2, if P happens to be the center of circle C1 and Q happens to be the center of circle C2 and the fact that we are told that PR is equal to QR in which case of course they will have the same radius because P is the center of the first circle and therefore from the center to the outermost edge that's the radius this, if this happens to be the center then that's the radius therefore they will have the same amount same length of radius and in which case they will have the same they will have the same length of circumference in that case if 
this is the part. If if P and if P and Q happen to be the centers of C1 and C2, in that case, in that case, the answer would be answer would be C. They would be equal. The answer would be C. But if P if if P and Q are if P and Q are not the center, then the answer would not be C. If 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 P and Q are not the centers, then the answer will not be C. It doesn't matter what the answer happens to be, whether it's A or B, it doesn't really matter. The point here is that if P and Q happen to be the center, if P and Q happen to be the center, the answer would be C. If they happen not to be the center, answer would not be C. We have a conflicting answer. C, answer is C. If P and Q are the centers of the circles, respective circles, an answer would not be C if, if one of them or both of them are not the centers. And since there is no way to tell whether or not P and Q are centers, there is no way to tell. The answer is D. The answer to this question is D. We do not know. We do not know. Maybe this, these two circles do have the same circumference. Maybe they don't. We don't know where the P and Q are located. Do you understand? I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.